First Chronicles chapter 21. First Chronicles 21, verse 15. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld and repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And then we get down in to verse 16. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Now, there's no evidence in this context that I've been able to discover that this is anything but an angel of God. And we're seeing in here, as we tie this back into Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, that God has ascribed to this angel enormous power, enormous responsibility to go into the land of Israel and destroy 70,000 as a consequence of sin. Now, uh, let me develop that for just a moment, and then we're going to look a little bit what's happening here in this context. It's so interesting and so important. I don't want to just gloss over it in our attempt to understand about angels. But in this connection, you know, uh, what's going to happen on the last day insofar as angel activity and judgment is concerned? Let's turn to Psalm 35. Psalm 35, where we have a uh, an additional statement that relates to this. I'd like to give you just a couple of verses that that uh, might uh, tie into this. In Psalm 35, verses 5 and 6, where God is complaining and warning, complaining about and warning against the wicked of the world. He's saying in verse 5 of Psalm 35, Let them be as chaff before the wind, and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery, and let the angel of the Lord persecute them. And this, the context is here that judgment is going to come by the angel of the Lord. When we go to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, we, we discover there uh, in Matthew 13, beginning in verse 39, where God again is, is focusing on, on judgment day. We find there that it says, uh, the enemy are, um, you, let's take the last half of verse 40. That really picks up the context. So shall it be at the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Remember how Jesus put it in Matthew 24? In Matthew 24, verse 31, when he comes in the clouds of glory, it is the last day, and he comes as lightning shines from east to west. And you remember what verse 31 said? When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And, oh, excuse me, that's, that's another passage that uh, um, talks about angels, but that... Uh, that passage, and I was reading Matthew 25, verse 31, and it happened to also speak about angels, but the, the angels there uh, happened to be, uh, could be angels or believers, because all of his messengers with him, all of his holy messengers, uh, uh, we all come with him when uh, that is all who are in heaven who have died will come with him, all the believers will come with him. So that it happened to be a passage where it could either be the uh, angels or messengers. But let's go to Matthew 24, verse 31. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. The angels are going to be very, very distinctly involved in the judgment of the last day. Let me give you one other passage that relates to this, and that's 2 Thessalonians chapter chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, in, uh, again, we find that Christ is talking about, or God is talking about the end of the world. And he says, And to you who are troubled, rest with us, whom the Lord shall... Um, let's let's uh, begin with verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulations to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, 
in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in all of these passages, there's no evidence that we can understand this except as angels. And here in First Chronicles 21, God is indicating the role of angels in bringing judgment. Now, I know that people, believers, will be involved in the judging process. We will be the jury, as it were, sitting in judgment because we read in 1 Corinthians 6 that the believers will judge the wicked of the world or will judge men, rather, and will judge angels. But there is also the task of uh, all the other details of this, and apparently the angels are going to be completely involved in this, and that's suggested by First Chronicles 21. Now, we have to ask the question before we leave First Chronicles 21, what about this matter of Jerusalem? Jesus, or the angel, is beginning to destroy in Jerusalem. And the Lord beheld and repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And, and then David, as we saw in verse 16, sees that angel standing there with the, with the sword. Uh, uh, over Jerusalem. And then David and the elders of Israel who were clothed in sackcloth fell, fell upon their faces. And David said unto God, is, not, is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even it is I that have sinned and done evil indeed. It, even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. Then the angel of the Lord commanded Gad, that he's the seer, the prophet, to say to David that David should go up and set up an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David went up at the saying of Gad, which he spake in the name of the Lord, and Ornan turned back and saw the angel. And then finally we get down to uh, verse 26 because we're not going to go into this verse by verse. We just want to uh, summarize some of the ideas here. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel. And he put his sword again into the sheath thereof. And so Jerusalem was spared. Now, uh, we have seen that this angel is a literal angel that is actually destroying the people of Israel in, a, in the historical situation. But this angel of God is a picture of who? Is a, is a, a representation of who? Of God Himself. Of God Himself. Because who is going to destroy the wicked on the last day? God is. Vengeance is mine, God says. I will repay. And God has util utilized this angel as a picture or figure, a representation of God Himself. Well, what was the basis of the judgment not coming upon Jerusalem? Because they were part of Israel. They, too, had sinned. And remember, we saw from Second Samuel 24, verse 1, that God's anger was against Israel, not against David. It was against Israel because they had sinned. He just used David as a as a vehicle in order to set up this judgment upon Israel. Uh, who is interceding, first of all, for Israel at this point? Who is interceding? David is interceding, is he not? You notice we read here in verse 19, David said unto God, it is, not, is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even is it... Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed, but as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house. In other words, David has taken the place, the position that Christ has taken in paying for our sins, so that God looked at Christ as He is the one who has committed the sin. Now, David actually had committed a sin. Christ had not committed a sin in Himself. But nevertheless... And, and, of course, no parable is perfect in its, in its relationship between the historical event and the spiritual meaning or the heavenly meaning. But nevertheless, as we go through this very interesting intrigue and intriguing passage, we find that David is made to be a type of Christ. As he says, 
put the blame on me and my father's house. Put the blame on me. That's what Christ did for us. And because the blame came upon Christ, therefore the sword of God's wrath did not come upon whom? The spiritual Jerusalem. And who is the spiritual Jerusalem? The body of believers. Those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in a very curious way, a very interesting way, we see the, we see the grace of God, the wonderful grace of God that through the Lord Jesus Christ we can be saved from damnation. Incidentally, in this passage, you notice the focal point then gets upon the altar that, G, that David was commanded to build. In verse 26, David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called upon the name of the Lord. What does the altar have to do with this? The altar, again, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. The sacrifice on the altar is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because there is an altar, Christ, because there is an offering, a burnt offering, Christ, because there has been a sacrifice, Christ, that is, He is the one who paid. He is the one who suffered the wrath of God typified by the altar, typified by the burnt offering, typified by the sacrifice. Therefore, Jerusalem, all of us who belong to the kingdom of God are in that Jerusalem, are spared. The angel of death does not come. Interestingly, there's one other passage in the Bible where God uh, particularly focused on, on uh, uh, the angel of death. And that's found in, um, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 19. 2 Kings 19. The account is quite somewhat different, and it's not nearly as um, expressive or as as uh, there is not nearly the information that we find here. The situation is, and I just want to speak about it very briefly, the situation is that it's in the reign of King Hezekiah, about the time that the ten tribes of the northern kingdom were being destroyed by the Assyrians. And now the Assyrians headed up by uh, Sennacherib, who was the king, came against Judah and came against Jerusalem. And Hezekiah feared greatly because the enemy was very, very strong. And finally, King Hezekiah prayed to the Lord and, and asked for his mercy and for his help. And, uh, and then uh, 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 the Lord said uh, through the prophet to... to uh, uh, Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 32. 2 Kings 19, verse 32. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with a shield, or cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same way shall he return, and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it, for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand. That is, a hundred and eighty-five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Isn't that interesting? Corpse is dead, isn't it? And yet God uses the phrase dead corpses. I wonder why he did that. Would you have any idea? Maybe later on we'll talk about that in our question time. Why dead corpses? So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And then while he was there, he was also killed. Now, here again, we see a picture of judgment. The wicked, in the case of Israel, it was the house of God, if you will, because Israel typified the church, the corporate body. Here in... Uh, here in Second uh, 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 Kings 19, God is speaking about the world in general. But in either case, it is an angel that comes and destroys, that brings judgment. And the picture is that God is insisting that likewise God, who is typified by this angel, is going to bring judgment. All right, now... Um, We've looked at the major areas of the Bible that might show the power of angels and might give us clues as to why 
Christ would say in Hebrews chapter 1, or God would say in Hebrews chapter 1, that Christ was made much greater than the angels. Because after all, these angels, particularly the angel of death who has the sword, wielded great power in order to, to be able to do this. But there's one other aspect of angels which really gives us a, an idea why God uses the language of Hebrews 1 verse 4. And, and we'll conclude with this and then we'll be able to get back into uh, Hebrews 1. The big contention, the big warfare that exists in the Bible is between who and who. Christ on the one hand and his dominion, his kingdom, and Satan on the other and his dominion. And as we read the Bible and we read about this warfare, this uh, all of the statements in the Bible that relate to uh, Satan going about as an angel of light and Satan... Uh, 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 that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers in, in the heavenlies. And as we read in Ephesians 6, we get the impression, we get the impression that Satan is practically as great as Christ. It, it almost seems like they are, they are equals that are fighting against one another. Now, the fact is that Satan is an angel. He absolutely is an angel. And therefore... We can see that finally the, the ultimate reason why God has got to say that Christ is far greater than the angels. Now, Satan, uh, who was an angel, really got very big, very big. In fact, what was his initial sin? What was his initial sin? Where would we look for that? Isaiah chapter 14? Isaiah 14. Let's read about this just a moment. Isaiah 14, we read in, in uh, verse 12, where God declares, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Incidentally, Lucifer here is not the name of the angel that became Satan. This is a, a Hebrew expression here that means the shining one. It, uh, it, it's not really a name, it's more a description of Satan, that he was a very uh, glorious angel. How art thou fallen? Uh, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Now, now we finally come to a passage where there is actually a controversy. We have an, a, a challenge where here is this angel that dares to say, I will be like the Most High. Now, let me prove to you so that there's, there's no question that he is an angel. If we go back to 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, we find there that... Uh, uh, it's, uh, it says in, in verse, in verse uh, 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Or we read in Jude, right before the little, the little book just before Revelation, in Jude, verse Six, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. And then we compare those passages with Revelation 20, where specifically is talking about Satan. And notice the similarity. Notice the similarity in Revelation 20, in verse 1. I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him. You see the parallelism between Second Peter 2 and Jude verse 6 and this passage. Indeed, Satan is an angel. And, and yet he has 
dared to come up against God as if he is equal to God. And God is assuring us in Hebrews chapter 1, don't you believe it for a moment. The angels are far less than Christ, that Christ is much greater than the angels. Now, we'll finish developing this in our next study just a little bit further. And then we're going to get back into Hebrews 1, and we're going to ask the question, what is this inheritance that Christ is talking about here, in, or the Bible is talking about here in connection with the Lord Jesus Christ? And what does it mean here that he has obtained a more excellent name? What does that really signify? And then if we get time, we'll start getting into verse 5, where it says of the Son, This day I have begotten thee. And that's a provocative statement, because the word begotten implies a beginning. And when did Christ have a beginning? Isn't he from everlasting? Well, these questions we'll save for our next study.